want to say happy Sabbath to everyone. In the presence of Jehovah. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, sister. Just checking with my text. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. <clears throat> Just want you to know that uh, I'm so thankful that God is good. Uh, this morning I'll be preaching on spiritual warfare. Just want to know, is this, are you plugged up in, up there? Can you see it? No? Okay, I'll leave it like that for now, and I'll put it up. I will tell you one thing for sure. Satan is not going to give up this fight until God settles him in the dust. And until, and until we understand that, we're going to keep losing the war. We have to understand that we are mortal beings and there is no good thing within us. None whatsoever. So no matter how hard we try to win this fight, we will never win this fight. But when we surrender all to Jesus, praise God, Amen. we will win this fight. Amen? Amen? So the topic this morning, like I said, let me get this over here, is spiritual warfare what makes it a spiritual warfare, and can I win this spiritual warfare? Let us pray. Father, we come into your presence, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and we are so, so happy to know that you have this world in your hand. And anyhow, we feel down and out, or broken, or feel that we are not victorious, we can look away from self and look to you and have that blessed promise that he who began a good work in us will complete it until the end. And we thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus to be that precious lamb so that we can live again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 There are some things I'm going to go through. And as we all know, I'll use the Word of God and some quotes to get some certain points across. Now, we know one thing for sure, that God and His Word have been trying to show us what had happened from the beginning of time and what it will be at the end of time. And I thank God that that's what He does, because Romans chapter 15 I believe in verse 2, but I put verse 4 by mistake on the other one. And it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for what? Our written for our learning. That we through what? Patience. Patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah for this scripture. Amen. Because it is written for our learning. So that means if we're ever going to overcome through the blood of the Lamb, if we're ever going to overcome the enemy, it has to be this book. It can be no other book than this book. It can't be a book that I find in the bookstore, because even if I find books written by other authors, the truth of the matter, they're still quoting from this book. But I want the Holy Spirit to bring me to all truth. So let's go back a little bit. So it was written for our learning. So... Why are we in this battle? Why is it that, because I have to say, I find it so unfair that when I get up in the morning, that I can't do what I want to do, and that means follow Christ with my whole heart. Why can't I just do that? Why can't I just automatically do that? I mean, I read his word, I pray, I seek him, I ask him for help, and I say, Lord, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter and I'm the clay. But yet, 
somehow this clay seems to mess up. But there's a reason for it because someone came and distorted the truth. And it was this enemy. And because of this enemy, he is not only an enemy of Christ, but he's also an enemy of us. And his name is Satan. In Testimonies for the Church, page 302, she says, Satan is Christ's personal enemy. He is the uh, what? Originator and leader of every species of rebellion in heaven and in earth. His rage increases. We do not realize his power. If our eyes could be open to discern the fallen angels at work with those who feel at ease and consider themselves safe, we would not feel so secure. Evil angels are upon our track every moment. That means even now while we're in here and we're also listening to God's word, he is on the attack. He's going to make sure that somehow something comes into your mind that you don't even pay attention to God's word. And if you got a problem, he's going to make sure that if you got bills to pay, he's going to make that that number one priority in your mind right now because the word of God should not be of any significance to you. That bill should be a significance to you. That's what is weighing you down. But God says, listen, I have an answer. So what strange thing happened in heaven? Because now that we know that he is an enemy of God, then obviously he's an enemy of us. And what usually happens when you're having an encounter with an enemy? That's right. You better believe it, war. So what took place in heaven? You better believe it's war. But let me uh, re read something from early writing. She says, angels were engaged in what? Yeah. Satan wished to conquer the Son of God, in other words, Jesus, and those who were submissive to his will. But the good and true angels prevailed, and Satan with his followers was driven from heaven. So what? Who conquered? What? Who did Satan wish to conquer? And who else? And anyone that wants to submit to his will. So that means every time you and I try to follow Christ, we are going to be on the attack. And we better get that story straight. That's why the Bible says pray without ceasing. Many times we take for granted because we get up out of bed and we can't see with the spiritual eye that the enemy is on our track. We tend to go about business as normal and just a prayer. As some people said, a wing and a prayer. But in, in Isaiah 14, verse 12 to 14, mentions why Satan was thrown out of heaven. Well, sometimes we get this way, believe it or not, because when we are defiant and we're not obedient to God, this is how we sound. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how great thou cut down to the ground which this weakened the nations. I, and he says these words, I will what? Ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne, and I will be what? Don't you know that every time we sin, we tend to exalt ourselves above the Most High? That means whatever he has to say to us is not important. It's not valid. We might not want to look at it that way, but the truth of the matter, if sin is hateful to God, and we sin against him, then we're committing a hateful act. And what we're saying is that we want to be like the Most High. Do you know sometimes when we get up in the morning, we don't pray before we leave the house? We behave as though one who says, I will be like the Most High. In other words, I control my destiny. We don't think about it that way. But believe it or not, every time we disappoint God, it is the accuser of the brethren that points and says, see, he wants to be just like God. He's not listening to you. But I love what the scriptures are going to say forward, going forward. But one thing I can say, because of his pride, thank God, there was a war in heaven and he was kicked out. And Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 to 10 lets us know. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angel fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Hallelujah. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And it says, and the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. 
And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For what? The accuser of our do you know that, you're, that when you're a follower of Christ, you're a brethren of Christ? Accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God, what? Amen. So every time you and I get up in the morning and we pray and we ask God for guidance for the day, this old devil is looking for ways to accuse us before the throne of grace. But I am so thankful of the God that we serve. I love that he put such a secret text in the Bible that simply says one thing. The Lord knows the heart and the motive. The good thing is that Satan cannot read our hearts. Amen? He can only watch what we're doing. He can only see what we're doing and kind of assume we're going in this direction. And he plots and he plans. So the question is going to, that I want to ask is, what warning is given to us that live on the earth. Well, I'll tell you what. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 12, it says, Therefore rejoice, ye heaven, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is what? Come down unto you, having what? Great wrath, because he knoweth not he hath but a what? So what is he coming down with? And the thing about it, when we hear about the devil, we just think of him as just, maybe he's a nice guy. Maybe he won't bother me today. You know, I seem to be doing good today. So that means he didn't bother me today. So I must be doing good today. If Satan ain't bothering us on the hour, every hour, every moment, we're in big trouble. We need to pray some more. I'm not saying that we should ask to be beat up and mugged and raped and what. I'm saying... In order for us to keep our eyes on Christ and to continue to be in prayer, we need to make sure that we are in his divine will. Because if Satan is not given up, if he, the Bible says, has great wrath, then you and I have no safety net. So facts you need to remember about your enemy, Satan, and know how to defeat him. So let's go to Romans chapter 13, verse 1 in the Bible. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. And in Romans chapter 13, verse 1, it says what? Let every soul be what? Subject unto what? The higher powers, for there is no power but what? But of God, the power that be are ordained of God. So what is that saying? It's saying that Satan has only what? Yeah, he only has what? Permitting. He only has permitted power. Thank God. Because if he didn't have permitted power, you know what that means? We'd have been dead a long time ago. He has permitted power because under the assault of the enemy, there was one thing that God sent his son for. And what was that? To die for you and I. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever what? Believing in him should not what? Perish. Remember that. So the reason why we have not perished in our trials is because of the love of God. And no matter how much he wants to be on our back, we need to know that. But I also love this little writing here because... Satan is on our track, but there's someone who's also holding him back. And it says it in heavenly places, page 99. Angels of God are watching where? Over us. Upon this earth, there are thousands and ten thousands of heavenly messengers commissioned by the Father to prevent Satan from obtaining and what? An adv any advantage over those who what? Refuse to walk in the path of evil and these angels who guard God's children on the earth are in what? Communication with who? With the Father in heaven. So when we pray, do we have a guardian angel? You better believe it. As a matter of fact, when you and I were born, each and every one of us was given an angel. Did you know that? We have two angels. Did you know that? There is one that's with you at your birth. 
Remember when the Bible says, and everything will be brought to light in the end? That's the one that writes everything out. Did you know that? We're being judged, so he writes everything. And by the way, what do you think your sec what your second angel is? Well, it all depends. Because if you live an unrighteous life and you die, your angel will not mark your spot. But if you die a righteous individual, your angel will mark the spot where you've been buried, will fly into heaven, and on the day of resurrection morning, hallelujah, that angel will come to greet you by that grave. Amen. Will reach out his hand and say, your father calleth you. Amen? Amen. So hallelujah. So that means, but, but you know what? We can't have those angels unless what? We're abiding in his will. Let's look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Let's see what 1 John chapter 4, because the only way we can do that, resist that power, is we've got to find it in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. So in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, what it says? Ye are of God, what? Little children, and have what? Overcome them because what? Greater is he that is what? Than he that is what? So that means all power is what? Is resident and available to you. Amen? Praise God. And that power can only come from where? The word of God. Amen? In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20. Let's look at that. Ephesians chapter what? And let's read that next verse. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. And what does it say? Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we, what? And think according to what? To the power that what? So in other words, those two texts let us know that you can do what? Greater things than the enemy. Amen? Amen. Because God gives that power. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, for time's sake, it says, There had no temptation taken you, but such as is what? But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be what? Tempted above that ye are able Able to what? There. But will, with the temptation, also make a way of escape that he may be able to what? There. So even though we know that Satan is limited in what he can do, we know that God allows trials to come to us, believe it or not, that he knows that we can overcome. Did you know that? So that means... If someone is getting on my last nerve and I feel like I want to respond, I have to remember that there are angels that are excelling in power that is able to make me stand for the Lord. That's number one. Number two, God has promised that there's no, no temptation that I cannot bear if I am connected to him. Amen? So that means... Whoever is coming at me, that means, number three, I should be able to overcome. But then I ask the question, why is it sometimes that I fail then? If God says that he gives me no more than I can bear, then why are we failing? Because we can talk about prophecy, we can talk about the sanctuary, we can talk about all manners of things. But the bottom line is if we're not being victorious, none of it would ever matter. Because it would all be in vain. We have to start learning to have a relationship with Christ now. We've got to understand one thing. If we don't understand what that relationship looks like, Satan is going to always get us. We have to reach a point where we fall in love with Jesus. And we're going to find that out later is how we do that. But I know one thing. And I've read this before. That the angels of darkness are to stand back. That the soul purchased by the infinite sacrifice of Christ 
may attain unto perfection of character. So when the angels are there, what are there for? What was their purpose? For us, for us to go unto what? Perfection. Unto perfection. And the word is sounded. Stand back. This soul is not yours. It has been what? Again, stand back. I and my father are one and we have come to draw the soul to righteousness. If the soul is not drawn to Christ, it is because it will, it, it, that the will is not what? So if God's word says that I can do it and I'm not doing it, then that means my will is not on the side of God. So I can't blame God for my failures. I have to blame myself for my failures. It's one thing to read and memorize scripture, because people are very good at that. They feel because they memorize scripture, they can beat the devil. Well, guess what? He memorizes scripture too. And he knows it so well, he likes to put a twist on it. But the truth of the matter, you can memorize all the scripture you want, but unless that scripture is abiding in you and living in you, and it's the word in action, there is nothing it can do for you. It will be just as visible as it is here on paper. That is why the ungodly does not understand this book. That's why they can mock this book. They mock it in ignorance because they never read it. Or even if they read it and couldn't understand it, all they could do is look at the word, but it cannot convict them because they will not submit to it. If we are not being victorious, then that means we're not submitting. That means, you know, some of us, we're very good. We will go to the Bible and we will look for texts. We hear that we should look up promises, how to defeat the devil. And we'll look up all the texts that we could find to help us come against the devil. And we will use it like witchcraft. We'll start casting spell at the devil. I can do all things through Christ that's trying to me. But guess what we do? He laugh at us and then we fall. You can't cast spell at the enemy. If the word does not live in us, then there's no way we can be victorious. Is there an example in the Bible on someone who's been victorious? Of course, it was Jesus himself. I love what Jesus said because <laughs> Jesus knew the devil from the beginning. Amen? Amen? But even though he knew him from the beginning, he had to come to planet Earth as a baby. Didn't come as a man. Didn't come as a teenager. He came as a baby. There's a reason for that. He came as a baby, and he had to relearn everything from the mouth of Mary. Mary had to point Jesus to the scrolls. And he had to be taught from the scrolls. The Bible also tells us that Jesus not only read the word, but Jesus also had a relationship with his father. The Bible says he gets up early in the morning and he begins to pray. Amen. She also says he sings. God loved the praises of his people. Sometimes we have no victory because we don't know how to praise. Well, well. You know, what I love is sometimes as an artist, we get to sing songs by other artists that we love. But sometimes there are certain songs that I really love in the hymnal, and there's a song that is no longer in our hymnal, but it's called Yield Not to Temptation. And what I love about that song, when the enemy comes, that song to me is a prayer because the way it is worded, you can't help but tell the Lord in a song, and the enemy has to step back because you're giving him praise. But you see, it depends on the words you're using in your praise in order for God to act. Because if your praise has no meaning for victory, God cannot respond. Because you can, you can sing songs by your favorite artists, and I won't call out any names, and some of them will do you no good. Because Satan says, I know that song. Try another song. And you're still going through your, 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 your cardex of songs on your iPhone or your Android, and you're trying to sing them all, and Satan is just looking at you, try again. Try again. It's like one who wears a crucifix around their neck, and they feel because Christ has died on the cross, and they wear the crucifix that somehow they will be protected, but Satan laughs at that cross because he knows what that cross exactly means. And the cross doesn't mean victory. The cross means death. 
But if you're going to wear that cross, then you must be dead to self. Because that's what Christ did. He died to self so that you and I can live. But what I love is what Luke 10, 18 says. Because it, it, I know Jesus. He said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. <laughs> I can imagine when he's reading from the book of Genesis. And as he goes through and he saws, see the book of Ezekiel, of how Satan starts to exalt himself. He begins to see this whole picture and he, and he remembers. But now he's on the earth and now as our example, he is tested. In Matthew 4 verse 4, and we know this text very well. We see here that Jesus is face head on with temptation by the enemy. How many times in you and I are tempted that we use this? I have to admit, sometimes when I'm tempted, I use my own thoughts. When I don't have a good devotional life for the day. But when I serve him, when I worship him in the morning and I praise and I study his words, then there is something for me to come against the enemy. I love what Jesus says. It is written, man shall not live by what? But by what? Every word. Now, when Satan came to tempt Christ, there's something very interesting that I need for you to understand. And it's a quote that she makes. And I hope you understand that when you study this Bible, when we study this Bible, it gives us spiritual antennas, spiritual insight that when we walk, we can sense when the enemy is around because the word lets us know when he's around. Because when something goes out of place, we will know. Because if it doesn't line up with this, we know he's close by. The reason why Jesus says it is written is not because he wanted to quote scripture. He told him it is written because of what he says. It wasn't his appearance. Look what she says in Review and Herald, July 22, 1908. It was by who? Satan. Satan's word, not by his appearance, that what? The Savior recognized what? Amen. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Because Jesus had hid the word in his heart, it wasn't so much about his dazzling look, but it's what he said. Just like in the world today, when God is trying to talk about the Sabbath and Sunday, most people don't want to take the word. They want to take what they hear. They want to be dazzled by some other doctrine. But it's not until they come to the word of God and they see the truth, then they want to follow the Savior who is Lord of the Sabbath. But the beautiful part is that she also says, Satan left the field vanquished foe, prematurely dismissed at the word of Christ. Get thee hence, Satan. The powerful fallen angel had no choice but to obey. Angels that excel in strength were on the battlefield guarding the interests of the tempest soul and, resist, and ready to resist the foe. Have you noticed when you read scripture that every time something happens to Jesus, angels come to minister to him afterwards? Have you ever noticed that? That is also telling us that we should be aware that God has angels following closely by us. That we are not alone in this world. Sometimes we live as though we live unto ourselves, but we are not alone, brothers and sisters, because every time we pray and we ask God something, his angels are there excelling in strength to make sure that we carry out his will. Amen. In John 4, 7, verse 7. Let's look at John 4, verse 7. I mean, sorry, James 4, verse 7. Thank you, sister. James 4, verse 7. It's a text that many of us well, know very well. And what does it say? Resist the devil and he will what? So submit yourself to who? When Jesus got up early in the morning, the first thing he did was submit himself to God. 
And by submitting himself to God early in the morning, he was able to resist the devil. The good thing is, if we oppose the Satan by God's word, he will flee from us. But I want to give you a look at another important text, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 to 13. But I'm going to read it to you in the Amplified Bible. I like how the Amplified Bible put it. I also love how the King James put it. But the Amplified Bible likes to use the Greek, likes to express the Greek and the Hebrew in the verse itself. And this is what it says. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, contending only with the physical component, but against the rulers, against pow the powers, against the world forces of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places, meaning they're supernatural. Therefore, put on the complete armor of God so that you will be able to successfully resist and stand your ground in the evil day or danger. And having done everything that the crisis demands to stand firm in your peace, fully prepared, immovable, and what? Victorious. Is God looking for people that are going to be perfect on planet Earth? Yes or no? Yes. He is. And the only winning strategy we have for defeating the devil is we got to realize that we don't struggle against flesh and blood. That means you and I should not be fighting against each other. Amen? Amen? Amen. That's why I love what 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5 says. It says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the what? And what is that weapon? When it says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, what weapon do you think he's talking about? Who is the weapon? Only one person shouting? This is the weapon. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The Bible you hold in your hand is a spiritual book, brothers and sisters. And it says, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Why? Because casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against what? The knowledge of God, which you find here, and bringing into captivity every thought to what? So I'm going to wrap it up in a couple of ways. So then, if the weapons of our warfare are carnal, and if it means that we need this word, this word that will come against the enemy, then what doorway, what doorways of demonic possessions and influence should I guard against? Because obviously Satan is finding a way or finding an avenue towards getting us. Is that not true? Because is there anyone in here that's perfect? Anyone in here that hasn't sinned? Wow. Well, let me tell you something. <laughs> it's interesting that when I ask that question, in certain places, some people hold up their hand. And I smile to myself. Because when they do that, I say to myself, it's just out of pure ignorance. It's just out of pure ignorance. Because if we understand the word, none of us can ever claim any type of perfection. And even if God is perfecting us, we will not know because we're not busy looking at self to see if we're perfected. We're looking at him. Amen. And it's by looking to him, the author and finish of our faith, that he perfects us. Amen. So we can't claim perfection. And that's why we don't believe in that doctrine, once saved, always saved, because we always have a choice to walk away from God. Yeah. Yeah. Now in Philippians chapter 2, Verses 5 to 6, if you want to be able to do that, we start with this. Let this mind be in you which also is in Christ Jesus, who being in form of God thought it not what? Robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and made in the likeness of men and being found in the fashion 
as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He became our example. So in other words, Christ is simply saying to us through his example that we have to understand that we are nothing but man. We're nothing but flesh. There's no good thing in us. But the only way we're going to make it is we have to have the mind of Christ. Amen? Amen. But sometimes it's difficult to have the mind of Christ in a world like this. When you look at the brain, the brain has a lot of circular system in there. And it has neurons and dif different pathways. Scientists have proven time and time again that if you change behaviors, they change a pattern in your brain. So in order for us to have the mind of Christ, we have to let the word do the, the new patterns in our brain. Amen? But the only way we're ever going to defeat him is we have to understand what's going on with this brain. In the book, Mind, Character, and Personality, page 72, it says, the brain is the capital of the body. What is it? We need to pay attention to that. And she goes on to say, the seat of all the nervous forces and of mental action. The nerves proceeding from the brain control the body, but the brain nerves, mentally impressions, are conveyed to all the nerves of the body as by telepath wires, and they control the vital actions of every part of the system. All the organs of motions are governed by the communication they receive from the brain. So in other words, if this mind is to be the mind of Christ, then we have to train this brain to be like Christ. And it's not an easy task. Especially when we are brought up in a world where we learn things differently from our parents. Some of us never had the, 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 the privilege of having godly parents. Some of us were brought up under tyrants. And because of that, it's so difficult to see a loving God when we fall. And that's why until we come to know him through this and have a relationship with him, then we will see the kind of God that he is, that he's nothing that the world portrays or what some fake Christian is trying to describe him. Because our God is an awesome God. And our God loves us so much that he's not willing that you and I should perish. So no matter what struggles or warfare we're going through, he is there to the last fight to make sure that we don't fall. Unless we decide to move out of the way. The only way we can do it, and I've talked about this before, is we got to guard the avenues of our soul. We got to guard these senses. She says in Adventist Home, page 490, or 401, it says, All should guard the senses, lest Satan gain victory over them, for these are the avenues of the soul. So, if those are the avenues of the soul, what admonition is given concerning my emotions and feelings? Because if I got to guard the avenues of my soul, then that means I better take control of my feelings. Amen. You know what gets the best of us? Feelings. Somebody says something, and that feel is like it evoke a certain spirit. The emotions begin to weld up, and it's very hard to control sometimes. And sometimes we choose not to control it, especially if we don't like the person who we're having the argument with. We say, forget it, Lord. Let me have it. Let me have my own way. Just my own way. But remember what I say when we ask for our way, and I'm learning this for myself. That when I choose my way, I'm exalting myself above, above, above God, and I have my pride set before him, and I want to be greater than him. I am telling God, I don't need your instructions. I can do bad all by myself. I can be the God of my own universe. Don't you know that's what the world teaches today? Nowadays, with all the spiritualism going on, they're teaching that you are God, and the God powers within you. You are a God. You, are, you have the power over your, over your destination. Well, to some extent, yes, you do by choice. But you sure have no power whether you live or die. So they need to get that story straight. But the bottom line is what Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says. It says this. The heart is what? 
deceitful above all things, and what? Desperately wicked. Desperately wicked. You know why the Bible uses the word desperately wicked? In other words, if someone says something to me and I blow up, that's wicked. That is totally wicked. And I'll tell you why. Because number one, I have no, no remorse that God is watching me. Because I am not engrafted into his word. So because I'm not engrafted into his word, I put God out of the picture. That's number one. That's wicked. Number two, when I act out and I say the things I do, and trust me, I get caught up in that myself sometimes. And what I find out also is this. <laughs> and we learned this in law enforcement. Most couples tend to have fights when they come home from work. Happens anywhere between 6 all the way to midnight. You know why? Because when people come home from work, they're tired, and Satan knows it. He knows it. Because when, when anything blows up, you're trying to say, listen, leave me alone, give me time for myself. But we don't say that. We, we respond and we expect everybody to read our thoughts and our minds. But the bottom line is God says, when we are not engrafted in this word, we do wickedly. So when we shout at our spouse or shout at our friends or whether you're single and, you, and you're dating or you're single and you have a friend and your friend is getting on your last nerve, the bottom line is we respond and we respond wickedly. And we need to call it for what it is, because when we don't look at it as a wicked act in front of God, then we play down sin to nothing. And sin becomes the norm. If we're ever going to make it into the kingdom of heaven, we have to understand what God's word is saying. And I have to understand what God's word is saying. Amen. That we cannot allow sin to take advantage of us anymore. Amen. We can't allow it to have first hand in our life. We have to be able to identify it and call it by its name and ask God to help us. She says in the book, Testimonies 5, 515, it is not your feeling, your emotion, whether it's good or bad, that makes you a child of God, but doing what? So in other words, don't trust your feelings. So after six, when you come home and you're feeling tired, whether it's me or any, any of us here, we've got to learn that when we park our cars in the garage or outside the garage or on the street, we need to pause for a moment and ask God to take control of our mind and our hearts. Because when we walk through the door, we're going to meet other souls that God is fighting for. And when I blow up, I am not a good testimony for him. Are you getting what I'm saying? You and I have got to start thinking spiritually, Amen. that the battle is spiritual. So we need to park our cars or whether we take the bus, if we get off the bus or on our way to our final stop or whether we're riding our bicycle or we're doing our scooter or skate, we need to pause for a moment before we open the door and walk through that door and say, Lord, I've had a bad day. It wasn't a good day, Lord. But bring my mind into captivity. Bring it under your word. Bring me under subjection. And Lord, give me a heart like thine. Amen. Because it's not easy, brothers and sisters. So what one is given about bad association? Because sometimes it's who we keep company with. You know, the funniest thing is that we have more co-workers as friends than church folks. Do you know that? It's sad to say in the church. We have more friends outside of the church than we have inside of the church. In Psalms 1 it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of scornful. Do you know that sometimes we do take counsel from the wicked? You know how many marriages have been destroyed? What girl? That's what he does. Oh, I wouldn't do that. I'll do it this way. Or brothers having conversation. I won't give you that one. But I will tell you this much. 
is that when we are not lined up with God and have godly friends that we can go for godly counsel, whatever our worldly friends are feeding in our mind, they go into our subconscious mind, and Satan waits for the opportunity for those advice to come out in your conversation so you could tell your spouse or tell your friend exactly what you just learned. And it's interesting that what we speak about, before we even say it, we made a choice to adopt it and then to say it. And we're not off the hook. Because we can't say, it's my friend told me. No. Even though they told you, you stored it and then you used it. So, how should I regard worldly things like fashion, movie, wealth, activities? You know, as Christians, it's very hard for us to have any type of activity in this world. There's some parks you go to. Let me tell you something. I don't know. Lord, help me. I can't even jog on my own block. I don't know what is it these sisters are wearing. They want to call it their exercise tights. I can't even begin to describe. And I, would, I dare not describe what I see. But I'll tell you this much. I think they just wear those things so they could show what they got. The saddest part is that, and how can I word this, Lord? The saddest part is that we ask for respect. We ask to be treated kindly. We ask that you don't touch. We ask, don't look. All these requests, but yet, the things that pass you by seems to be an invitation for the brothers to look. And some brothers sometimes want to touch. That's why we're in a whole lot of trouble here. But the sad part is, I now find Christian sisters doing the same thing. Now I work in a certain area of town in Sacramento. And I remember, you know, my office faces, part of my office faces the street. I won't say which church they were from, but I can tell you one thing for sure. There was one of my sisters that I noticed, and boy, was she just trotting her thing. And all I have to say is, Lord, have mercy on all of us. Because Satan have got some of us so blind, we think it's the normal thing to do is to dress like that and go out. And the sad part is, they look no different than the people I see in the world. In other words, I couldn't point out and say, that's a Christian. Or I couldn't say, that's a follower of Christ. But the sad part is, we need to be careful of what we're doing. Even what we watch, what we wear, and sometimes in wealth, some of us, we're gambling. We're, we're putting our money in stock markets, and we can't keep our mouth shut. We have to let everybody know we're in stocks and how my stocks are doing well, and you ought to invest in stocks. I don't want to hear about your stocks. Keep your stocks. I don't care about your stocks. I really don't. Because the bottom line is this. The stocks won't get us into Calvary. Amen. And it sure won't get us through the gates of heaven. Amen. You know, we used to hear a song, if the rich would live and the poor would die. Remember that song? But thank God we can't buy our way into heaven. Thank God that poor folks, Amen. or they say poor folks, can get to heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, through 70 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is what? The lust of the flesh. Describe that. I don't have to go back through that again. The lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of what? The world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth what? Abide it forever. So brothers and sisters, we've got to abide by this book. 
It's a frightful thing when we allow the enemy to have his way. But now the question is, as we're closing, how do we close the doorways and entrances? Because many times, like I said, we always say, listen, I don't know why I do the things I do. As we read in the book of Romans chapter 7. Why do I do the things that I do? Why is it that I'm not having any victory? But I thank God now for Romans chapter 8. Because Romans chapter 8 made it very clear the reason why. is because only the spiritual will make it into the kingdom of God. It is not the carnal mind, but it's the spiritual mind. Amen? Amen. And I'm so thankful for that. Because I love how Paul ends the scripture by making it very clear. He said, now who shall deliver me from this body of death? But I love that the end is Jesus Christ who does it all. Amen? Amen? Amen. But then Romans chapter 8 brings it home a little closer. And I love what Romans chapter 8 says. And Romans chapter 8, starting with verse 1, says, there, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not what? After the flesh, but what? After the spirit. So Psalms 101 verse 2 and 3 says these very verses. If we want to walk after the spirit of God, then we have to do this. Psalms 101 verses 2 to 3 says, I will set no what? Wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside, it shall not what? So that means, if I hate the work of them that do wicked, then that means I have to pay cl close attention to the association I keep. Because if the association that I keep does not line up with God's word, then we're in big trouble. Do you know that sometimes the wrong companies that we keep influence the way we live for God? I find sometimes we are good at accepting advice from people of the world, but we're not good at giving advice to eternal life for them. Yet we say we love God, but yet we will take any advice from them. But as Christians, we don't even tell them about the salvation of Christ. Sometimes we never stop to tell them and use the word of God and says, you're gossiping. And this is why I can no longer gossip with you. We don't open the word and we don't say to them that the way of man leads to darkness. But instead, we engage and before you know it, we become more like them. Because the scripture says, by beholding, you become changed. So if we're not being victorious, then we need to stop and think, who are we associating with, uh, with that is not helping us to change? Because you've got to reach a point in your life where you have to cut some people out of your life that are going to make you fall deeper and deeper into sin. And I know sometimes we're afraid to do that, but the question is, do you, choose your, do you love your friends more than you love God? Do you love your children more than you love God? And do you love your spouse more than you love God? Because until we can answer that question fairly, then no matter who our friends are in the world, no matter what they say to us, we will never give them the gospel. We will always hear their gospel. You see... There should always be an even exchange. Not so much just for advice, but also now that I've heard what you have to say, I know someone that can help take care of that rent. As a matter of fact, you want to meet down the corridor for a moment? I want to pray for you. I want to pray that God would open the doors so that your rent can be paid. Amen. Do you know that ministering angels will answer our prayers if we're faithful to God? And will make sure open the door for that person's rent to be paid as a testimony to your faith in God? How many of us pray like that? 
We can't pray like that because we don't have that relationship. And we have to develop that type of relationship in order to prove to God, to people, that God abides in us and that he is a God that answers prayer. Sometimes we live our lives as so-called Christian among our workers, and sometimes we come in and we say, man, I'm having problems with my wife, I'm having problems with my husband, I'm having problems with my kids. And then the poor person who's in all of this, hearing your murmuring complain and saying to themselves, are they supposed to be Christians? Are there supposed to be people that are abiding in Christ? I thought he was the one who gave them victory. And then they say to themselves, well, you know what? They ask for my advice. Let me give them some of my advice. And then we sit there and we listen to the advice, but we never go to God with our issues or our problems. And we got to be very careful. Second Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5 says this, and it's so important. And I love the latter part of it. It says, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So if we find ourselves where the enemy, this warfare we're going through, we have to start realizing, listen, Satan, you can't have dominion anymore. I am now opening my eyes and I'm now seeing the world that I live in and I can see you all around now. Now I know that there is power in this word. Now I know that there are angels that are excelling in strength that will push you back if I call on the name of the Lord. We are not alone in the earth. Sometimes we always talk about Jesus or we talk about God or we talk about the Holy Spirit, but we never talk about ministering angels. They're ministering angels. They minister to your needs. They hear your prayers. And when God answers the prayer, he answers it through them. So no matter where you are in your life, whatever trouble you may be having, whatever is harassing your soul, your mind, your spirit, God says, just bring into captivity the thoughts. Bring it into the obedience of Christ. Because only Christ can give us victory. So my final advice and recommendation is something that Ellen White says in closing. She says, Satan often finds a powerful agency for evil in the power which one human mind is capable of exerting on another human mind. Listen to this carefully because the friendships that we keep of this world can get us into trouble. This influence is so seductive that the person who is being molded by it is often unconscious of his power. By the subtle working in these last days, he is linking the human mind with his own, imbuing it with his thoughts, and he is doing this work and is so deceptive a manner that those who accept his guidance and know not that they are being led by him at his will, the great deceiver hopes so to confuse the minds of men and women that none but his voice will be heard. So if we're not careful, we will think we're hearing the voice of God. There are many of us, our minds are still stuck in the holy place. Some of us, our minds are still stuck in the outer court. For some of us, our minds are stuck outside the gate. But until you get to the holies of holy, you will not be able to discern the enemy and his voice and when he speaks. You know why there's so many mental illnesses in this world today? You know why? Because of the things we see, the things we taste, because they're messing with your food. It's amazing in certain states that I've read, there's so much lead in the water that they don't even tell them until it's the last minute. And so in the long run, people are acting out in ways that they don't even know why they're acting the way they're acting. And the reason for that is because Satan is trying to destroy our minds. He's trying to make sure that in some way we are not connected to the vine, that somehow we'll be in a stupor and accept where we are at as being acceptable to Christ when it's not. We got to be careful because the things of this world, if we continue in them, it will harden our hearts. 
Jesus says in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 32, For I take no pleasure in death of anyone, declares the Lord. People think that God is out to get them. God is out to kill them in their sins. That's not what God is about. He's not winning that any should perish, or have, but have eternal life. So God is not in the business of trying to destroy anyone. He takes no pleasure in death. So even when our loved ones die, he's not taking any pleasure in that. And when we go through temptation and we fall, he's not taking any pleasure in that. He's still calling us to get up. But even though he takes no pleasure in that, Isaiah 59 verse 2 says this, But your iniquities or sins have separated you from your God. So as long as we continue to dilly-dally with sin, it will push us further and further away from God. So in closing, we need to study the scriptures just like the Thessalonians in Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 12. They search the scriptures daily to see if what? If anything that Paul was saying is so. We need to search the scripture daily to see the antidote for our recovery from sin. We need to have our Bibles in hand. I also love what she says here. Temptations often appear irresistible because through neglect of prayer and what? The study of the Bible, the tempted one cannot readily remember God's promises and meet Satan with the scripture weapon. In other words, when Satan came against Christ in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, he said, it is written. That's the only way we can defeat him. She went on to, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, Isaiah, uh, Psalms chapter 19 also speaks of something that I like. Let me just go to that and wrapping it up. In Psalms 119, 9, 11 says, Wherewith, withal, shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to what? And thy word have I hid in mine heart that I what? Might not sin against thee. The weapons of our warfare, brothers and sisters, is the word. And I love what she says, but angels are around about those who are willing to be taught in divine things. And in time of great necessity, they will bring to their remembrance the very truths which are needed. Thus, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Amen. But angels. Amen. That's why in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 7 tells us this. All scriptures is given by what? Inspiration of God. And is what? Profitable for doctrine. For what? For reproof. For correction. For instructions in righteousness. That the man of God may be what? Perfect. Thoroughly furnished. Unto all good works. So, if we're going to defeat Satan, it will only be this scripture. Amen? Amen? That's why I love this text that is coming up next from Philippians chapter 1. So let's review. Satan only has permitted power. All power resides in us. You can do greater things than the devil himself. Satan is limited in what he can do. If you oppose him, he will run from you. And your winning strategy for defeating him is to wear that whole armor. And you even have the power to cast him out. And the only way to cast him out is through this word. So be confident in Philippians 1 6. Be confident of this very thing that he which had begun a good work in you will what? Perform it until the day of Jesus. For whatsoever is born, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. That is our closing text. Jesus is saying, come unto me. We must make up our minds that in order to defeat the enemy, we need this book. Amen? Amen. So let's learn to read it on a daily basis. Let us learn by reading this word that the language that come out of our mouth will be these words and not our own. It's okay sometimes to say something of our own when you're helping someone that's hurting. But it's also good to add a little promise to some of our words. 
to show people that we have a Savior. And that our Savior loves them even when they're hurting. Not that I'm your best friend or I care about you and I love you and I'm sorry that you're hurting. But you got to let your friend know that you are also connected to the vine. Amen. And your friend has to know that you love Jesus. Amen. And that everything that he says, he will do. I noticed that, uh, do you want to still do? Is it up there? Okay, my dear sister wanted to do another song, and I let her go ahead and do that song, and after that, I will pray. Amen. Sister? You? Yeah. So in the meantime, brothers and sisters, be faithful. And don't give up because we will fall. The Bible says a righteous man falls what? Seven times. But I know as, right, as a people who are serving God, we fall more than seven times, don't we? But the whole idea of the text is that he doesn't fall seven times, but what does that righteous man do? He gets back up again. So even though we may fall and we may disappoint our loved ones or we might disappoint our friends or we might disappoint each other, we should never let that discourage us from not getting back up again Amen. and serve God with a whole heart and a whole service. Okay? Do you have the song for, uh, ready for her? Go ahead. We know not the hour of the Master's appearing, yet signs all foretell that the moment is nearing. When he took tis a promise, green, but we know not the hour he will come let us watch and be ready he will come hallelujah hallelujah he will come of his father's bright But we know not the hour. Last stanza. We'll watch and wait with our lamps trimmed and clean. We'll work and we'll wait till the master's returning. We'll see rejoice. Every omen discerning, but we know not the hour. He will come. Let us watch, be ready. He will come. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He will come, the thoughts of his father's bright green. But we know not the hour. Even though we know not the hour, he still asks us to watch and be ready. That's all he asks. Amen?
And I'm so thankful that that's all he asks of us. So in our watching, let us pray. And though the enemy may come up against us as a storm, we know that Christ will make things all victorious. Let us pray. Our kind and heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the God that you are. You have brought us all together for a purpose that we may behold your character. And by beholding your character, we will be changed. For your character is just and true. So Lord, as we go through this week, as I pray for myself and for each and every one of us, help us, Lord, to be under the subjection of your Holy Spirit. Help whatever comes against us, that self will not rise up, but that it will be brought into subjection. Remind us that anything we do outside of your will only shows pride and only show that we want to exalt ourselves above you. And Lord, we don't want to do that. We want to exalt Jesus Christ and not ourselves. So remind us when sin or temptation comes our way and feelings are invoked and emotions are invoked to cause us to sin against you, Lord. Remind us that we are to bring our mind into captivity under the love of Christ so that we can live victoriously. Help us through our life to break down the walls of prejudice, to break down the wall of hate, but to show the love of Christ. Bless us now, we pray, and help us as we go our different ways. And for those of us who may stay for a meal, bless the meal. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name.